fine concepts of animal structure and function. Just kind of let me get my pointer kind of ready here, and I will be ready to go. We're going to have about 15 minutes um, to do uh, this particular lecture. Okay. Um, concept in here is is that our bodies uh, need to keep themselves within a narrow range in order for us to basically remain alive. We don't work at lower temperatures, we don't work at higher temperatures. And so when it gets too hot, we need to cool ourselves. And again, behaviorally, we can do things like throw water on ourselves to cool. We can do other uh, stuff. Extreme conditions of, law of, of a cold and hot can have an effect on our body's function and have an effect on our brain's control. And it can be uh, life threat threatening. Um, we talked about this hierarchy of organization in life a lot, and in animals, uh, we still have this organization. And the big thing in animals, and living animals, is that basically animals are able to move. And in animals, individual cells are grouped up into tissues, and we saw that in plants as well. These tissues combine the foreign organs, and again, we see that in animals and well, uh, in plants as well. And these organs are organized into organ systems, and the organ systems make up the entire organism. And so here we have a graphic to show you this. And so here is a muscle cell. That muscle cell comes together to give us the, the uh, uh, mus muscle, the tissue. Uh, that muscle tissue is part of an organ, which consists of other tissues as well. And those organs come together to give us an organ system, and which is part of our entire body. And so there are roughly about 11 different ideas identified organ systems that make up the body of an animal, and we will go through those um, pretty easily. Um, another concept that we want to get in, uh, in biology and science is that this form fits function, is that analyzing biological structures gives us clues about what it does and how it works. So things kind of look like what they do, and again here, um, we see the, by these big wings that this organism here probably flies. This organism here, if it flies, then is going to need to reduce its weight. So here we have these bones that have a structure that allows it to be strong yet really um, uh, light. And at a cellular level, these are neurons that interact with one another. And how neurons work is by, uh, again, amassing many dendrites that talk with other organisms as well. And that's um, critical and important for them. A couple terms we want to know. Um, anatomy is basically the study of the structure of an organism. The physiology is the study of, of the function of the organism's structural component. And so anatomy, you're just knowing what the thing is. And in physiology, you're learning what it does. What we call a tissue is an integrated group of groups of similar cells that perform a specific function. And there's four main categories of tissues in animals. We have what's called the epithelial tissue or the epithelium, which covers the surface of the body and these lined organs and cavities within the body. And so everything is packaged within a tissue. And so here's an example of an individual. And again, we have the outer epithelium and we have these inner tissues that all are this epithelial tissue. So any surface that we have on an organ is going to be a, a tissue. Okay, here's an example of squamous epithelial tissue, and, uh, and uh, again, a, a lining of the uh, small intestine, which is absorption tissues, uh, columnar tissue. Uh, we won't get into that uh, that much. Um, again, epithelial tissue cells have specific characteristics. They're bound tightly together. They typically form a protective barrier, and they um, are constantly being renewed. They are growing uh, constantly. The next type of tissue that we will look at is what we call connective tissue. Connective tissues have sparse population of cells in an extracellular matrix. That's important, extracellular matrix, consisting of a protein uh, fibers within a uniform foundation that may be jelly-like, liquid, or even solid. Again, the structure of connection tissues correlates with its function. Uh, uh, again, that's to bind and to support and to assist other tissues. And so we could take something like the knee and look at it and look at all these tissues that we have in here. And there's lots of connective tissues in here. Fat is a connective tissue. Blood is a connective tissue. Uh, the ligaments and tendons are all connective tissues. The hyaline cartilage is connective tissue. And so, again, if you can... Um, Look at that, that would be great. Muscle tissue consists of bundles of long, thin, uh, cynical cells called muscle fibers. This has special uh, proteins that contract. Um, 
Muscles basically are one of the two types of tissues that make us basically animals. They allow us to move. And again, we have skeletal muscles, which allows us to do things like think about and run a basketball. We have smooth uh, muscle, which allows us to do things like move through our, uh, move food through our intestinal system. And then we have cardiac muscle, which allows us to kind of um, uh, beat our hearts. And then lastly, one of the things that people may say makes us animals is that we have this stuff called nervous tissue, which makes communication of sensory information possible. And uh, again, we have brain and spinal cord, that is some animals do. And what this allows us to do is to have something happen on this part of the body, that that message will come into a sensual processor in this part of the body, and that that uh, brain can make us do something even on this part of the body in order to uh, do that. So again, if you step on something that's hot, you can move your foot away from that hot thing. Okay, so we went over the four main tissues, epithelial, connective, muscle, and nervous tissue. Next, we want to look at our organ systems. An organ uh, consists of two or more tissues packaged into work, work, one working unit that does a specific function. And things like the heart, liver, stomach, uh, liver, brains, and lungs are all organs. And so if we look at these, they would give us a specific uh, type. And again, we have epithelial tissue on the outer surface of it. Um, and, that, and so this is, uh, again, tissue that's um, involved in absorbing nutrients from the, the gut. Organ systems are teams of organs that work together and they perform vital functions. And so we have roughly about 11 of them. So the skeletal system supports body and anchors the muscles. The circulatory system transports substances throughout the body. The uh, respiratory system um, moves uh, materials in and out of the body. The digestive system is responsible for the breakdown and absorption and the movement of food outside of the body. The muscular system is responsible for movement. The urinary system is responsible for uh, removing excess water as well as some waste products from the body. The reproductive system here is responsible for um, Again, our species being able to replicate itself, okay, here again. Our integument system is responsible for uh, covering and protecting the outside of all the squishy and liquidy things on the inside. Our limbic, limbic and immune system are our defense against small little pathogens that we have. And our nervous system is responsible for doing all the things like that, like thinking and thought and learning, etc. <laughs> okay. So what we get is we are organisms that are um, open systems that are external to the environment. And what we see here is an example of different types of living things from the amoeba to a uh, hydra here. And what we need to do is exchange stuff with our outer environment. And so what the amoeba will do is it will uh, pull in nutrients and remove nutrients directly from there. When you start to get larger and you start to get tissues, um, again, you get certain um, structures that are responsible for this exchange. And so in animals, in early animals, and what we see in protozoans, what we see is to start to see the development of tissues that specialize. In this case here, we have an outer tissue, we have an inner tissue. And the reason is because in this organism here, you're living inside of your food and you're taking in what you need from the food. But food's not always gonna be there. And so what happens, organisms that capture and digest their food will actually have what's called a gastrovascular cavity where they bring the food in and they digest the food there and get rid of waste. Another problem is that uh, we are almost always bathed in fluid and we have to exchange that fluid. Uh, again, we need to exchange material with our environment. Here's an example of the, the lungs. This is the um, bronchial tube. This is where the air comes in and this is where the blood comes into the lungs. Um, the, organis the three organ systems that exchange materials with our external environment are our digestive system, our respiratory system, and our urinary system. And we'll go in those in a little bit more detail. The circulatory system transports materials inside the body and exchanges on that surface. And so this is really what I would like you to guys to kind of get to know a little bit and what I will talk about in class. And basically, it's kind of a model animal. <laughs> All animals are going to have stuff like this, and this talks about it. We have an external environment that the animal cannot control. 
uh, we have an internal environment that the animal can control and it will spend a lot of energy in order to control that. Food needs to be come in and be processed, absorbed, and then the materials that are not used by food are, are, are released. In our circulatory system, in our circulatory system, we need an exchange of gases, a, a high surface area, respiratory system. Um, the blood not only interacts with the nutrients, but it also has, interacts with its gas system. And what it has to do is it has to um, get rid of wastes that are produced by the body, and that would be in the urinary system. Again, all this is all materials that support, and all this is surrounded by an epithelial system that protects this inner system from the outer environment. It regulates what comes in, and it regulates what goes out. A typical animal. So again, let's talk a little bit about more about how an animal regulates its internal environment. And it doesn't have to. Sometimes it doesn't have to. Homeostasis is the body's tendency to maintain relatively steady conditions in its internal environment uh, when an external environment exchange. That's kind of the definition of life, is where we're able to do stuff and not just let stuff happen to us. The internal environments of vertebrates is what we call the interstitial fluid, which fills up our spaces in between our cells. And so what can happen is the external environment can change greatly, but our internal environment, where we have our organs and stuff like that, are optimized to perform and certain physiological characteristics and we will see those remain the same. Now how this is done is, um, you know, so how is this control done? Is A lot of times we have what we call a negative feedback loop and this is an example of a negative feedback loop that you guys have all experienced is basically uh, it's the heater inside of your house and so you want your temperature to be roughly about 20 degrees Celsius which is about 68 degrees Fahrenheit it's not too bad and what happens is that when the room temperature is above the set point your heater will stop and then the room temperature will start to drop you have another set of negative responses is that when the room temperature gets too low you will actually um, turn on the heat and uh, move this with this back so uh, again and we're using negative therm uh, using negative um, controls we either heat or cool the room if the temperature gets above um, if we heat our body if the temperature gets above the temp temperature then we will stop heating our body uh, we cool our body off and if the temperature gets down below a certain point then we stop doing that as well and these are what we call bracketed negative controls in positive feedback we result in a process that intensifies the same process and um, that's done very rarely and we'll do that and so what we want to look at here in, in thermal regulation we're looking at how we regulate temperature it's maintain maintenance of the internal body temperature and we have typically we have what are called endotherms that derive the majority of the body heat from their metabolism and ectotherms that define the body heat from their str um, str surroundings okay and uh, again, how this is, uh, we have this set point that we have here, and then when you get a little bit too hot, you start to cool off the body by basically doing something like sweating. Your body temperature drops, and then you can um, stop doing that. And again, for heating, you can do kind of the opposite. So there is control that happens. And I do want you to look at this control and be aware of this control. In osmolar regulation, we're controlling the loss or the gain of, of water, of, of basically water by an organism. And so we have osmoconformers, which basically their internal osmotic uh, conditions are the same as the external, and we have an osmoregulator, which is able to control its internal osmotic. And how we control that is basically with our urinary system. And here's an example of the urinary system right here. Uh, this is very important. Roughly about one-fifth of every heartbeat goes actually into your kidneys. And so you very tightly control the amount of liquid that's inside of your body. It's very critical that you know the structure of nephrons and kind of how the nephrons work. And so read your book and looking at uh, kind of how the nephrons. Uh, the nephrons perform um, four key functions, uh, filtration, reabsorption, secretion, and excretion. Um, and we'll go over those in a second. And so this is basically the structure of what it uh, looks like. And so our uh, blood is filtrated, so we don't want to get blood into our urine. This filtrate is then uh, selectively reabsorbed. The good things are taking out, like sugar, and secreted bad things are putting in, like um, 
uh, phosphoric acid and kind of things like that as well. Um, our kidneys don't always work for us all the time. And so we have, uh, being human beings, developed something um, that we call dialysis, where we're able to actually use an external uh, filtration system in order to do this. This is very expensive, about $100,000 a year 